Uh, all right. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. So, uh, so um, uh, I'm Suyan from uh, Professor Hassan School at Princeton. So, uh, so if you look at the program, you see five talks from our group. They are actually submitted by five group members. But uh, unfortunately, uh, three of them are doing experiments in Switzerland. So me and my colleague Nasser Alidus will uh, cover these five talks. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, cohesively all the five talks are about theoretical prediction and experimental discovery of uh, biosemical state in real materials. And uh, actually, I'm going to mostly talk about uh, the theory part. And uh, I was sort of relieved that uh, our invited speaker already left because I'm going to mostly talk about uh, chemistry. So, all right. So, uh, so our goal is. Uh, to discover new topological phases of matter, so just very quick introduction. So, uh, uh, so topological phases are in contrast to conventional phases. Uh, they're not described by local order parameter, but rather by a global number that is the topological invariant. And even up to until uh, 2011, there are only two, maybe two, uh, uh, experimentally discovered topological phases. These are the quantum power and the Z2. And uh, uh, so clearly there are many things to do in the topological world. And uh, one major thing that you see is that uh, both phases are insulators. Actually, their corresponding topological number uh, numbers are only uh, defined if the system has a full uh, insulating gap. So uh, the first question that uh, uh, many people will have asked is that uh, can metals also be topological? So this would uh, naturally lead to a uh, new topological invariant and therefore new topological phases. And it turns out that the answer to this question is naturally linked to a uh, very elegant piece of pioneer physics that is about fermions, so which is one of the three elementary fermions in high-energy physics. So basically, you take the mass term of the 4 by 4 Dirac equation to 0, then it's reduced to two of 2 by 2 independent sectors. Each of them is a wild equation, and the solution is a wild fermion. So the idea is that the uh, 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 so, uh, while fermions must be massless, it has a definite chirality, either left-handed or right-handed. And from this construction, you see that one Dirac can be decomposed into two vials of opposite chiralities. So, historically, this played a crucial role in high-energy physics. For example, the chiral nombi, which is associated with uh, uh, decay of the neutral pion, the neutrino, and uh, many other things. But uh, this particle has never been observed as a fundamental particle in high-energy physics. But it turns out that it can be uh, realized as the band structure of certain type of uh, novel topological metal. So this is uh, the biosan metal. So basically, in, in a crystal, while fermions come in pairs, and they're of opposite chirality, and then uh, uh, because, of, uh, because of the distinct chirality, they actually serve as uh, sources, uh, sorry, monopoles or anti-monopoles of the very curvature. Basically, you can visualize it uh, as uh, as a momentum analog of uh, magnetic monopoles, and this directly gives rise to a new topological invariant that is not possible in a topological insulator. So basically, you've got to uh, calculate the flux of the barrier curvature through a 2D closed circuit in k-space, and uh, uh, so then this will be always a quantized value, and the value will depend on the chirality that is enclosed uh, in this uh, in this uh, closed surface. So then, if you look on the surface. Because uh, from the wild fermions, you get two isolated points uh, that are monopoles. So this has to be connected by a Dirac stream, which is the new topological surface state. Its Fermi surface is not a closed contour, but an open arc. And that's why it's called a Fermi arc. So the realization of this uh, new uh, topological phase can give rise to many new uh, emergent pr protected topological pr properties. So obviously, it include the realization of wild fermions, uh, you know, uh, Fermi arcs and the uh, condensed matter version of the chiral anomaly. And because of those three fundamental properties, you're going to get many uh, exotic pro uh, properties that are both in the bulk and on the surface. So here are some of the examples. So to realize this, the, the principle is quite simple. You basically start from a direct fermion lattice and you break, uh, you know that this is nothing but two degenerate vials of opposite chiralities. So then uh, it turns out that uh, uh, if you break time reversal or space inversion symmetry, then this will uh, leak up the degeneracy between the two vials. 
and this will uh, split them in phase space and realize a biosemantic. So if you look at uh, uh, the theoretical literature, this has been known for really a long time. So, but the, really the true difficulty towards its uh, experiment is, uh, you know, how do we, the material parameter space is huge. How do we find a real material that is experimentally feasible so that uh, we can realize this new phase of matter? So, you know, traditionally ARP has, has been viewed as a mean of uh, some sort of sample characterization. Somebody found something interesting, maybe superconducting or topological what, or whatsoever, and then they take the sample to an ARPES guy and say, hey, this sample is interesting, can you measure the band structure for me? But uh, one day I woke up and I talked to uh, our colleague, Ilya, and we said, why don't we look for compounds ourselves? Is it hard? But let's try it. And uh, yeah, so then we uh, go onto the uh, crystallographic library. Turns out that you can search, and then uh, if you put in all the uh, space inversion, symmetry breaking uh, space groups, then uh, you can get 28,000 uh, entries. So this is obviously a huge number. And uh, for each compound, if you want to either conclude or exclude the existence of vial node, then you actually have to calculate the band structures throughout the k-point because vial nodes, they're not at uh, high along high symmetry lines, they're at uh, arbitrary k-points. So this means a huge amount of calculation for each compound, and now we have 28,000 of them. So, uh, so let me show you, this is uh, very well known in the chemistry, the ICSD is a crystallographic library. You can search based on the space group number. So, uh, for example, here number three and four are both space immersion breaking. And then you hit run, you get uh, more than 800. So now if you do all this uh, uh, immersion breaking space groups, you get that uh, 28,000 number. So now, this is huge. It's impractical to calculate all the compounds or do R has on all of these compounds. So how do we deal with it? It turns out that uh, we have to use our intuition and uh, in other words, we have to guess a little bit. Uh, but the gas should be intelligent gas, it should, should not be crazy gas, and uh, by, by guessing, uh, we cannot say anything for sure, but uh, hopefully we can significantly narrow down the number of candidates that we consider, so that then we can do some more systematic calculations or arguments. So uh, first, let's uh, loosely, this is not strict, but loosely let's classify the electronic ground state into four classes, so if I have a conduction and a valence band separated by a huge energy gap and the Fermi level in the, mid, uh, in the, at, the, at the middle, then I would call this an insulator. If the band gap becomes much smaller, then I call this a semiconductor. If these two bands cross, then I call this a semi-metal. Uh, and then uh, finally, if the, the chemical potential is not at the center between these two bands, but actually cutting deeply into one of the bands, then I call this a metal. So if we want to find a biosemantle, so mainly we need to look for, in, uh, look for things in the middle two types. So basically what we wanted to do is we want to carefully sift through the 28,000 compounds and try to ident identify the ones that are likely to be narrow gap semiconductors or semi-metals, and, uh, and then we do systematic calculation. So let me tell you one of the uh, useful algorithm or intuitions that uh, we have been using. So we can consider this uh, famous uh, ionic uh, you know, uh, uh, insulator, sodium chloride. So if I take the lattice constant to infinity, then I know that uh, uh, the conduction band would be always the cation, which means uh, sodium 3S. And, uh, wow, I don't know. Yeah, okay. And uh, the ania would always be, uh, uh, the ania is, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, a chloride 3 p and that is the valence band. So now, uh, I will uh, turn the lattice constant from infinity to the experimental value, so that nothing happens. Basically, the, the flat bands will gain some dispersion in k-space, because now the electrons can hop. Uh, but we know that from, uh, our you know, common knowledge that uh, sodium chloride is a big gap insulator. So now let's consider a pr uh, process that I want to excite one electron from valence to conduction. So that, loosely speaking, means that I want to drag one electron from chlorine 
back to sodium. Or even more loosely, I'm trying to undo the ionic bonding. And I know that this is extremely hard because sodium chloride, the ionic bonding is very strong. And from the band structure picture, I also know that this is very hard because uh, it will take, uh, 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 you have to overcome this huge energy gap to excite that electron. So this simple analysis tell me that, uh, you want to stop me or should I go, you guys two talks. Okay, so uh, this simple analysis tell, tells me that uh, uh, basically uh, the, the magnitude of the energy band gap gives me a quantitative uh, uh, sorry, a uh, qualitative measure of the ionic bonding spin. So now, let's consider a uh, sort of similar but slightly different case, sodium-3 bismuth. And uh, again, in, uh, if I take the lattice constant to uh, infinity, I know that the cation is sodium-3s, which has to be the conduction, and the anion is a bismuth-16, which will be the valence. But now, and uh, then they're separated by uh, energy gap, and all the bands are flat because that is constant infinity. So this part is exactly the same as the previous case. But uh, now, the key difference is that uh, I, uh, you see that uh, the ionic bonding spin in this compound is much weaker. And this is very intuitive because you know sodium really likes to donate one electron. And in the case of chlorine, it really likes to receive one electron. But then now you have sodium three bismuth. Bismuth as a single uh, element is usually a metal or semi-metal, and when it forms compound, it likes to be the cation, like sodium, uh, like bismuth selenide. But now it's forced to be the anion because sodium is even stronger. So that tells you that you know this this gotta be uh, much uh, much weaker the ion bonding. And what does it mean in the band structure picture is that now I can imagine when I go to the real lattice constant, there can be a possible band crossing. And why is that? So now let me choose a k-point that is outside the crossing range. At this k-point, I still pay energy to take one electron from bismuth to sodium. But within this uh, inverted range, locally speaking, it's actually energetically favorable for the bismuth to give the electron back to sodium. And even more loosely speaking, it's energetically favorable to undo the ionic bonding within the inverted range. So. Uh, so this simple analysis tells us that uh, a weak ionic bonding would suggest a likely band crossing, and therefore a light, likely semi-metal uh, ground state. So using this, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm summarizing some of the conceptual steps. Using a similar kind of algorithms, we have uh, search, uh, shift through the 28,000 compounds, and we have identified a number of compounds. And the chairman will stop me, and I'll take some questions, and then I'll continue. Yeah, so the next speaker is still